After a grueling two-week business trip, Tom finally returned home and slept soundly on Friday morning. But his sleep was suddenly interrupted by the distant sound of voices coming from below. Recognizing his wife Tammy's voice, he assumed she was on the phone. But to his surprise, he soon made out a man's voice. Curious, Tom decided to freshen up in the bathroom before going down the stairs. As he put on his gray sweatpants, he couldn't help but hear Tammy's cheers. It's wonderful. So are you really going back to the city? She exclaimed with obvious excitement. Tom sauntered around the corner and found a tall man with blonde hair sitting across from her at the kitchen table. He couldn't resist asking, what's going on here? Remembering their conversation about her childhood friend being able to return to the city, he realized, he's here, it's Sam. Having repeated this name out loud, Tom always believed that Sam was a shortened form of the name Samantha, believing that Tammy's closest friend was a woman. Stunned by the discovery, Tom exclaimed enthusiastically, Oh my God, it's just fantastic, darling. Goosebumps ran through my body, signaling a feeling of anxiety. In an instant, it became clear to him that the muscular man standing in front of him did not have a wedding ring. Tom, Tammy has talked a lot about you, and it feels like I've known you for ages, he remarked, rising from his seat and extending his hand to shake. But Tom was stunned when the man's grip turned out to be unexpectedly strong, which made him wince painfully and close his eyes. Ops, I'm sorry, the man quickly apologized. Grinning, Sam loosened his grip on Tom's arm. Tom, worried, shook his hand, hoping nothing was broken. When are you planning to move back? He asked. The van delivered my stuff yesterday, so I have a lot of work ahead of me. Tom's wife, affectionately calling him Darling, reminded him of their plans to dismantle the boat that same day. But Sam needed help, and Tom had already promised to help him in the afternoon. You can join us if you're not busy, Tom suggested. Have you talked yet? We decided to take the boat out of the dry dock and start preparing for tomorrow's trip to the lake with Gina and Greg. But then Sam intervened, saying that everything was fine. He has a whole week to make the house livable. Tom noticed his wife's frustration and reassured her. You know what? Before I do anything, I have to start the engine and ask the mechanic to inspect everything. Why don't you help Sam? He smiled, and she hugged him back. She straightened up, ready to help Sam. He noticed that she was wearing a thin, transparent robe, and it was obvious that she was not wearing a bra. Thank you, my love, he said, anticipating a kiss on the lips. But she surprised him by kissing him on the cheek. At the same time, Sam, who lives in a place where there is no electricity or running water, was offered to occupy a spare bedroom until Monday or Tuesday. Is this a normal arrangement? Tom has reached his limit. It was nice meeting you, Sam, he said, turned around and headed back upstairs. Standing there, he reflected on the current situation. When he was adjusting the temperature of the shower water, he suddenly heard the door open. She expressed her displeasure, saying that it was rude to leave without warning. He tried to contain his anger. Seriously, Tam? I've said three times that we have to work with the boat today. Moreover, you've known for weeks that Sam is moving here. I can't believe you forgot to tell me about it. And now I'm no less surprised that he suddenly showed up here this morning. Why are you reacting like that? He's just a friend, nothing more. You decided to give preference to your friend over our plans for today, leaving me to help him. I don't mind. Now please leave so I can take a shower. Tom, your behavior is irrational, and I will not communicate with you when you are in this state. We can discuss dinner later. With that, she turned around and left. As she finished her breakfast, thoughts of her connection with Sam flashed through her mind. It all started in the third grade on the school playground when another boy tripped her up. She tripped and scratched her elbow. Just as she was preparing to retaliate, she saw him crash headfirst into the swing. She thanked the unknown boy gratefully, and then got to her feet and began to soothe her bruised elbow. She asked curiously, Are you new here? Grinning mischievously, he introduced himself as Samuel. 
He furrowed his brows in concern when he noticed the bleeding hand and insisted that she seek medical help from a nurse. Offering his support, he added, I will accompany you. From that moment on, their paths intertwined, and they became inseparable companions even at the tender age of nine. They shared a passion for video games and TV movies, getting great pleasure from playing and watching together. Despite teasing from others, they stubbornly maintained that their relationship was purely platonic. Over time, their bond grew stronger. They joined the same football team, enjoying the camaraderie, and spent Saturday mornings roller skating side by side. Due to the discrepancy in Sam's parents' work schedules at the hospital, he practically began to live in Tammy's house, becoming an integral part of her family. By a happy coincidence, Sam began taking Tammy's family with him on a beach vacation to Delaware, and her parents accepted him as their own. This wonderful connection has been preserved throughout the school years. The sleepovers stopped as soon as she reached puberty and her body began to develop. The situation became more and more awkward, but they managed to maintain friendship among their friends. Both had other romantic relationships, but they never crossed the line of something more. Just a month before the long-awaited prom, he plucked up the courage and invited her as his date. Do you want to come with me? He asked. She smiled broadly, but when she saw the expression on his face, she realized that she had made a terrible mistake. You're like a brother to me, she stammered, instantly feeling the devastation that had gripped him again. Please forget I even asked, he snapped, his disappointment obvious. Getting up from the sofa, he made a move to leave, but she quickly grabbed his arm. Don't leave, please. Give me time to talk. Sam, I value our friendship very much and I don't want to jeopardize it. I love you as my best friend, and I can't lose this connection. Taking a deep breath, he reluctantly sat down on the sofa. I understand your feelings and I share them too. But I'm not looking for a romantic partner right now. Let's leave it purely for fun, and let's not complicate the relationship with romance. You hold a special place in my heart and I want this ball to remain in my memory forever. Sam took the initiative to rent a tuxedo and a limo and stood confidently on the doorstep before ringing the doorbell. Betty, Tammy's mother, was stunned and exclaimed, Oh my God, look at you. You've become a very young man. Tammy's father joined her, expressing concern about Sam's plans for the future after graduation. Sam blushed and respectfully replied, no, sir. I assure you my intentions are noble. Don't worry, Dad. Please let him in, Tammy begged, her voice full of urgent pleading. Reluctantly, the door swung open and Sam froze, mesmerized by the sight of Tammy in her stunning dress that accentuated all her curves. He noticed her seductive cleavage for the first time and was momentarily speechless. Tammy blushed and reassured him, Come on in, you fool. It's just me. Betty quickly captured their joyful moments, capturing hugs and even a light kiss on the lips before they hurriedly headed to the waiting limo. I feel like Cinderella, she whispered, overwhelmed with charm. As they danced, she fell down next to him, clutching his strong hand tightly. At that moment, he became her prince for the night. Lost in the charm, they rocked together. Their bond was undeniable. Leaning her head against his shoulder, she felt desire rise in her stomach. With a mischievous grin, she moved closer, attracted to him like a magnet. When darkness descended and music began to play in the air, she threw her face up, closing her eyes. Time seemed to stop when their lips finally met and their tongues danced in perfect harmony. Unaware of this, a photographer from the yearbook captured their moment. Tammy... I thought you didn't want this, he whispered, feeling her soft breasts pressing against him. I want tonight to be special. Only today and tomorrow they will become best friends again forever. They shared another passionate kiss, and the rest of the night turned into a haze as they hurried to a waiting limo and spent the next hour or so at a motel. In the room where the sign of inaccessibility still hung, they embraced tenderly, showering each other with kisses, when darkness enveloped them, 
They quickly took off their clothes and hid under a blanket. Their lovemaking was filled with gentle touches and caresses, enhancing their desire. But their passionate meeting was suddenly interrupted when he hurriedly pulled away, leaving her perplexed. What happened? What is it? She asked, puzzled by his sudden departure. He rushed into the bathroom and quickly returned, clutching a wet face cloth. I was overcome with desire, he explained, panting, and I wanted to protect you from a possible pregnancy. They hugged, bursting into laughter. I think we make better friends than lovers, she chuckled. A moment later they dressed shyly, and he ordered a limo to take them home. Well, that certainly brightened everything up, she cooed, exchanging a gentle kiss at the doorstep. After the ball, their romantic relationship came to naught, and after a few months they went to different colleges located a few miles from each other. Just before he left, he wrote her a heartfelt letter. He expressed remorse for accompanying her to the hotel, and expressed the hope that she did not harbor any ill feelings towards him. She treasured the letter he wrote as a memory for the future. During the Christmas holidays, her surprise knew no bounds when he appeared on the doorstep of her parents' house with a gift in his hands. Sam, what brings you here? What is it? She asked. He replied, Tammy, I missed my closest friend so much that it tormented me. We made a terrible mistake at graduation, and I want to know if we can erase it from our memory and start all over again. Tears glistened in her warm brown eyes. Oh my God, yes. I really want my dearest friend back. She jumped into his arms and hugged him tightly until her mother appeared in the doorway. Who's there? Sam? It's you? Thank heavens you've made up. Come in and join us for dinner. Over the next four years, they spent vacations and summers together, but their bond never fully reborn to the level of best friends. After graduating from college, he contacted her, saying that he had moved in with his current girlfriend and tied the knot. Despite the circumstances, they maintained regular communication. Sam once expressed his appreciation for their friendship, but admitted that his wife's jealousy had become a serious problem. When Sam told his wife about their friendship, she became furious and demanded that he end the friendship. Sam tried his best to convey to his wife that they could have a close friendship without any intimate relationship. At the same time, he assured her that he appreciated their friendship and would continue to support her if she needed a friend again. In conclusion, Sam urged her to take care of herself and reminded her of her importance in his life. Unfortunately, that was the last message she received from him. Just a few months ago, he contacted her by email, informing her of his intention to return to their city. In his sincere message, he talked about his recent divorce and that he really wants to renew their once cherished friendship. And so, the exchange of letters and messages resumed without difficulty. That day, Tammy, dressed in jeans and a loose t-shirt, was sitting at the table when Tom suddenly came down the stairs. She expected him to go into the kitchen, but instead he headed down the hall towards the garage, and she had to hurriedly meet him at the door. Are you seriously going to leave without saying a word? He ignored her look. I have nothing to say. Obviously, so do you. I'm curious if you'll join Greg and Gina on the yacht tomorrow, or if you'll be busy with household chores with your boyfriend. To hell with you, Tom. Your behavior is incredibly unpleasant and infuriates me. Moreover, I've already told you about Sam. Before she could finish, he closed the door. Well, the situation is really disappointing, Tammy sighed. Her closest friend finally returned to her, but this unwittingly created a barrier between her and her spouse. Sam confessed to her that his wife got upset whenever he talked about their unique bond, and now she found herself in a similar position. Depressed by the situation, she dialed Sam's number, shared her feelings about Tom, and asked him to tell her when she could visit him. Tammy, I think we'd better take a step back now. It's pretty obvious that Tom doesn't want me to stay with you until Monday. Besides, you have to help him prepare the boat, he said, acknowledging the need for a temporary pause. If I'd known you had something to do, I wouldn't have asked you to help me unpack. 
Despite his stupid behavior I'm already on my way to help you. I have your address and I'll be there soon. Goodbye. That day, after the mechanic examined the boat's engine, Tom muttered to himself. She claims that they have always been just friends and have never cheated on me in the past. On the way back, I'll buy some beer and try to make friends with this man. When he entered the garage, he noticed that her car was still missing. When he looked at his phone, he didn't find any messages from her. First, she dumped me to help him unpack, and now she hasn't even bothered to text me about her return or our dinner plans. Ugh, I really need to stop having imaginary conversations. Thirty minutes later, he got out of the shower and caught the sound of their laughter coming from the first floor. Curious, he stood on tiptoe again, wanting to eavesdrop on their conversation. His wife chuckled as she flipped through her old high school yearbook. You look very serious in the graduation photo. Leaning over playfully, she lightly slapped his muscular arm, teasing. You look like a complete nerd. He continued to laugh until she suddenly jumped on his back, causing them both to collapse sideways onto a nearby sofa. At that moment, Tom came in and found her sprawled on his body, playfully stroking him. Confused, Tom asked, What kind of laughter is that? Reacting quickly, she quickly pulled away from him and explained the situation. Looking at old school photos, they both felt a little uneasy about their closeness. He silently hoped that Tom wouldn't be upset that their bodies were so close. But when Tom burst out laughing, he felt a sense of relief wash over him. Laughing, Tom asked to see the photos. Tammy, on the other hand, still harbored anger and was not ready for her husband to leave his place next to her and wedge himself between her and Sam on the couch. Unaware of her husband's intentions, she asked cautiously, Is that really you there? At that moment, she really wanted her husband to behave differently than before, and she hoped that he would not repeat his previous actions. She hugged him, wrapping her arms around his shoulders, and playfully pressed her breasts against his side. In a teasing tone, she asked, Don't you find me beautiful? Then Sam and Tammy began to introduce him to their classmates, creating a sense of lightness and calmness among all. Shall we order a pizza? suggested Tom, wondering if they had already eaten. She apologized and replied, Sorry, honey, we haven't had lunch and we're very hungry. We decided you'd have a snack at the lake earlier. We decided to stop by Maggie's for a quick bite of burgers but you couldn't call or text me just in case, he said, although he tried to hide his annoyance at not being noticed. I'm thinking about ordering a small pizza for myself, and I decided I'd make a phone call to place an order. Okay, let me show Sam the spare bedroom and give him fresh towels for the shower, she suggested. Wanting to join in the conversation, Tom added, I'll join in too, and then we can all chat to strengthen the acquaintance. She bent down to give him another peck on the cheek. After that, Tom arranged for pizza delivery. When the show started playing upstairs, he settled down with a beer in his hand and returned his gaze to the album. His gaze settled on her photo, accompanied by Sam's sincere confession of their eternal friendship. As he continued to flip through the pages, a series of pictures from the prom caught his attention and he became curious about who Tammy was dating that evening. But his heart skipped a beat when he came across a picture of her sitting next to Sam at the table. Are they just platonic friends? His breath caught in his throat as he turned the page, and the sight before him almost left him speechless. There she was, captured in an intimate dance with Sam, snuggled in his arms. Closing their eyes and pressing their lips to each other, they kissed passionately. Damn it, he muttered with obvious disappointment in his voice and angrily threw the album across the room. Upon landing, the album suddenly tore open and a small envelope slipped out of it. Curiously, he approached and noticed that the envelope was addressed to Tammy. Tearing it open, he quickly scanned the contents and unceremoniously threw the envelope on top of the album. A few seconds later, he grabbed the car keys and rushed out of the house. Meanwhile, Tammy was enjoying the comfort of cotton pajamas, bathrobe, and slippers, and her smile radiated pure bliss. 
Knowing that she would be thrilled with Tom, she was looking forward to a boat trip with their friends tomorrow. Suddenly, the doorbell rang, announcing the arrival of a pizza delivery. The sound was repeated, suggesting that Tom might be busy in the bathroom downstairs. Assuming this, she hurried downstairs to open the door. The young man standing there was informed that the bill had already been paid and handed him a rectangular box. Carrying it into the kitchen, she exclaimed, Tom, your pizza is here. When silence fell in the house, she became worried and began to look for him. After searching for him, she realized that he was nowhere to be found. Entering the room, she came across an album lying open on the floor and an open letter. Her heart sank when she recognized it as the same letter that Sam had written years ago, telling her about their meeting after graduation at the motel. Overwhelmed with despair, she collapsed to the floor and found Sam's bare feet next to her. What happened? He asked worriedly, kneeling down next to her. Tom found and read the letter you wrote to me. Tammy was horrified when she realized that he knew about their meeting at the motel after graduation. Damn it, Tam, she muttered to herself, wishing she'd torn up that incriminating letter. Panic gripped her as she thought about how to fix the situation. Deciding to make amends, she quickly took the phone out of her purse on the hall table and dialed Tom's number. The phone rang several times until it finally greeted her with Tom's voicemail message. Tom, please come back. I really need to explain everything, she pleaded, regret and despair in her voice. The prom and that motel, these were huge mistakes, and they caused great pain to both of us. Trust me, we are really just close friends. My dear, I love only you and I want only you to be with me. Please come back to my house. She waited patiently for over an hour and made another call. Meanwhile, Sam was sitting in front of the TV, anxiously waiting for Tom's call. When the clock struck 11, he went up the stairs and began to pack his things. Tammy was still sitting at the kitchen table, not taking her eyes off the phone. Suddenly, she raised her head. She noticed that he was dressed and clutching his small bag tightly. Where are you going? What is it? She asked with a note of concern in her voice. I've already caused enough trouble. I still perfectly remember how devastated my wife was when she found out about our unique friendship. I refuse to be the reason that your marriage will fall apart just like mine. He asked her to hold out her hand to him when she was alone. She wanted to beg him to stay, but deep down she knew it would be wiser if he left, at least for now. At the same time, she had to find a way to minimize the consequences of this situation. Okay, she replied reluctantly. I'm truly sorry that things turned out this way. She moved closer to him, wanting to hug him tightly and not wanting to let him out of her embrace. She tilted her head back and looked deeply into his eyes. A sudden realization dawned on both of them. This closeness was the root cause of Tom's anger. Just saying goodnight to her, he reciprocated and left. Overcome with anxiety, she hurriedly sent Tom a message begging him to come back. Sam has left. Please come home. Let's talk, my dear. I love you, my darling. Exhausted, she lay down on the sofa and fell asleep when the clock struck one in the morning. When she woke up, she suddenly noticed that daylight had already filled the room. After quickly going to the bathroom in the hallway, she looked into the garage and saw Tom's car. He's home, she murmured softly. Tom returned to the house at 1.30 in the morning and found his wife sleeping peacefully on the couch. As he debated whether to wake her up, he couldn't shake the disappointment caused by her lying about her friendship with Sam. No matter how their relationship was going right now, he couldn't find the strength to trust both of them. There was only one decision left for him to make. Like him, the bright light of the morning sun woke him from his slumber. Changing his position, he felt the gentle touch of her breasts against his back. Good morning, Tammy whispered, touching her lips to his ear. I'm glad you came home. Slowly, her hand moved to his thigh. In an instant, desire flared up in him, but he abruptly pulled away from her touch. Tom, what's changed? 
I will no longer have an intimate relationship with you because you feel guilty. What happened between you after I left last night? How can you blame me for this? I've never cheated on you and I'm not going to do it. I didn't talk about the night with Sam because it didn't matter and happened before our relationship started. He's just a friend, and when you get to know him better, you'll understand that. Tammy, you need to make a decision now. You have to choose between him and me. Wow, are you serious? What happens if I don't make a decision? Giving up a choice is, in fact, a choice in itself. For your information, I'll spend the day on the yacht with Greg and Gina and be back by 8 o'clock tonight. You have time to make a decision. Tom, you're being stupid. I understand that you have a good relationship with Marianne at work, but what if I asked you to choose between her and me? It's an unequal situation. I have never kissed her or had an intimate relationship with her. Freaking out on the couch is also something I didn't do with her. You have a little time before I return. Tom, please wait. However, Tom had already left, leaving her lying on the bed in tears. Gina, leaning on Tom's arm as she boarded the ship, asked, Where's Tammy? A friend unexpectedly came to her in the city, and she decided to stay at home, so it's just the three of us left. Tammy and I are having some difficulties right now, so I decided to join you. I must admit that I am in desperate need of company at the moment. He expressed his intention to be a gentleman with a mischievous grin, looking at a beautiful brown-eyed girl who turned out to be his college friend, whom he introduced Greg to a couple of years ago. Actually, I think I could use your advice on one issue. Your trust in me makes me smile, she tossed the bag onto the deck. Besides... I really need a rest. The company fell into silence as their boat glided across the serene lake and eventually found refuge in a secluded cove. Suddenly, raindrops appeared from a cluster of ominous clouds. Ignoring this, they burst into laughter and jumped into the refreshing water. While they were gleefully splashing and playfully trying to dip each other, the sun came out from behind the clouds. Reunited with the ship, they boarded and reached for towels to dry themselves. After drying off, they took the opportunity to enjoy beer and wine, sitting on soft cushions in the stern of the ship. Who wants to be the first? Me, Tom sighed, leaning back into the cushioned seat. Over the next 20 minutes, he laid out all the details to Gina, telling her about the events that had happened since he found his wife and Sam at breakfast. I sincerely wish I could trust her, but she lied to me about the prom, he admitted. Well, she hid it from you, that's for sure, Gina admitted. And it looks like Sam is not just your best friend, but I find it hard to believe that she could cheat on you. Can't a man and a woman have a platonic relationship? Should we risk remaining such close friends and repeat our past mistake? After all, his ex-wife believed that there was more between them than just friendship. Maybe she was right, but I'm not sure about that. I talked to her, asked her to make a choice between us, but she didn't seem to want to do it. I don't know. You and I were friends before I married Greg, and I had special feelings for you too. Especially after our recent dispute about finances and my job. You were the first person I decided to share this with. Perhaps this is the situation. She tries to understand my point of view, believing that there is no hidden meaning in it. So maybe we can take a similar approach. I mean, if it doesn't hurt your relationship with Greg, actually, it might be good for me. He tends to ignore me, and I haven't received flowers or gone on dates in months. The group of friends continued to communicate and share their opinions. What are your plans for tomorrow? Tammy, still with tears in her eyes, looked anxiously at her watch. As the clock approached six in the evening, she decided to contact Gina and find out about their whereabouts. When she got no answer, she turned to Greg. Hi, Tammy. How are you? He greeted her. Sitting at home alone, he indulged in watching an NFL game. Judging by the background noise, there was a football match going on. Did you come back from a yacht trip? What is it? she asked. No, I didn't go, he replied. I decided to stay at home. Surprised, she asked. Weren't you supposed to be on the boat? He confessed. I didn't go either. 
This is a difficult situation. Understanding his difficulties, she sympathetically remarked, I can imagine. Gina and Tom probably went together, right? He agreed. I think so. Feeling that he needed to speak out, she suggested, Do you want to discuss this? Tammy expressed her concern, doubting whether it was wise to leave Tom alone with Gina all day. She said she felt neglected and unappreciated, as if she were just a maid and cook in our house. She also mentioned the lack of friends and hobbies outside our house, which made him hesitate. In response, I impulsively urged her to stop messing around and find something to do. Unfortunately, it became obvious that this was the wrong choice. She announced her intention to go on the yacht and do business without my participation. As if on cue, a notification came to her phone. When she saw Sam's name, she immediately realized that it was time for them to leave. Good luck, she said into the phone with a note of sadness. Hello, can you hear me? What is it? She asked, her voice full of concern. What are you up to? What is it? He asked with genuine curiosity. If you're suggesting severing all ties, I'll understand. We've started a mess with this letter and it's unlikely that we won't make even more mistakes in the future if we've already stumbled. But don't worry, I have other friends, she assured, albeit with a note of regret. It's a pity. I'm sorry, Sam, but... Tom means the whole world to me, and I can't stand the thought of losing him. Perhaps one day he will understand the depth of our friendship. Goodbye. She ended the conversation with tears in her eyes. As the day went on, she decided to meet him at the dock. Tom and Gina were heading to the pier when he noticed his wife standing on the pier. Come and hug me, he exclaimed. Overwhelmed with joy, Gina giggled and pressed her tender body against his back. He let out a groan as her slender finger slid over his shorts, igniting a fire in him. The boat was securely anchored, and Tom and Gina were sitting so close that their hips were touching each other, seemingly oblivious to Tammy's presence. Suddenly, Tammy's shrill scream broke the spell. Gina hastily pulled away, a hint of guilt showing on her face. Hi, Tam. We really missed you today, she greeted, trying to hide her awkwardness. Unfortunately, Greg couldn't join us, so it was just me and my old friend. Gina came down from the bridge wearing a tight bikini and no t-shirt. Her huge breasts, fitting into a third size, were on the verge of falling out. Stifling a laugh, she grinned and playfully pointed her index finger at Tom, who couldn't help but admire her demonstration. You're just a scoundrel, she teased. Noticing Tammy's tense and upset state, Tom glanced at his watch and reassured, It's only seven in the evening, so Gina and I will finish here. Let's meet at home tonight at eight o'clock for a discussion. Tammy was overcome with anger when she saw what upset her, and she was ready to tell him that Sam would remain a part of her life, even if he didn't like it. But she paused and wondered how Tom felt when he saw her playfully wrestling with Sam on the couch. In addition, she kept the information that Sam was returning to the city a secret, if he insists that she break off her relationship with Sam, she will do the same with Gina, despite the fact that he did not have a close relationship with her. As far as she knew, she didn't have an answer yet. Not knowing what to do, he pondered as she drove back to their house. It was almost 8 o'clock in the evening when she heard that Tom had appeared in the house. The sight of him and Gina on the yacht made her angry. To hide her true feelings, she put on a disinterested look sat down on the sofa and pretended to read a magazine. Hi, I'm home, he announced loudly. Well, have you decided yet, him or me? She replied in surprise. Both of them, you are my husband. He's not just a friend to me, he's my closest friend. The final answer, she snapped, without taking her eyes off the magazine. I told you, so you chose him. This allows you to determine my location. Hurriedly climbing the stairs, he headed for the shower. When he came out of the bathroom, pulling the towel securely around his waist, he saw that she was lying on the bed, wrapped in a transparent dress, and looked like a fragile doll. What happened? What is it? He asked in disbelief. She returned his smile, gently stroking her flat stomach. It belongs to you and you alone. He tossed the towel aside and headed for the bed. 
I used to believe that, but now I'm not sure. You spent the whole day with him today, and it's obvious that he genuinely cares about you. Maybe not today, but in the end, he will persistently pursue you. I can't guarantee that you will reject his advances. By the way, were you and Gina alone on the yacht today? I saw how she hugged you, how her ample breasts pressed against your back. Curiosity consumed me when I thought about where her hands were, tightly wrapped around your lower torso. The fact that you two were friends before we met made me doubt that anything had happened between you. But to add to my confusion, I was completely unaware that Sam was a man. Despite the constant exchange of emails, it never occurred to me. But the revelation collapsed when he unexpectedly came to my house, having recently moved here. Surprisingly, you immediately rushed to his aid, abandoning our plans to go on a boat trip. It was only later that I found out the truth. You and Sam had a romantic relationship while at school. Gina and I have always been close friends, never crossing the line of something more. The only moment of our intimacy was a simple kiss on New Year's Eve, nothing to do with the passionate encounters depicted in your album. You can believe me when I say that Sam and I don't have any romantic feelings for each other. Tom, I'm asking you, don't make me give up my best friend. I'm ready to let him go if there's a serious problem between us, but please give us a chance to prove our case. With a determined look, she reached out her arms to him and gently pulled him closer. They were locked in a passionate embrace, their lips met, and their bodies intertwined. Overwhelmed with longing, she couldn't help but scream, professing her love and urging him to continue. But in her enjoyment, she did not notice that he had not yet reached his point. When she woke up the next morning, she found that she had slept longer than usual and realized that he had disappeared. Her attention was caught by a small white marker board in the kitchen, on which was written a note indicating his location. He left to play tennis with Gina, promising to meet later perhaps for dinner at the club. She was left alone, having received an assignment to help Sam with the move, signed by Tom. Although she felt relieved that Sam was back, the thought of Tom and Gina being together made her uneasy. This anxiety was exacerbated by the problems Greg was having with Gina. Overwhelmed by conflicting emotions, she hurriedly dialed Sam's number. I thought we were done with this, came Sam's surprised voice on the other end of the line. Realizing that circumstances had changed dramatically, she urgently informed him, Everything has been turned upside down. I'll be there soon to help you move in and explain everything. Gina stood uncertainly at the house, grieving over the last breakup with Tom. The memories of his strong embrace and the long kiss before parting still wouldn't let her go, and she didn't dare to enter the house. Recently, Greg and she discovered that they were constantly fighting, Unable to contain her disappointment any longer, she expressed her anger at his habit of taking her for granted and questioned his ability to change. When she entered the bathroom, a note scribbled on the mirror caught her attention. The current tension between us is undeniable, and I have to take most of the blame. I really don't like my situation, and I feel the need to take a break for a few weeks. I will be unavailable during this time. Greg, on the other hand, was not well respected, and she muttered softly to herself before trying to call him. However, after receiving his voicemail, she ended the call without leaving a message. This was a typical manifestation of his cowardly nature. He ran away from problems instead of looking for solutions. At that moment, she decided to completely distance herself, wishing him good luck in finding his own path, and washed her hands of him. She hoped that the upcoming yacht trip without his presence would somehow excite him. Despite the uncertainty, she was grateful for Tom's presence, who gave her comfort and support during this difficult time. Curiosity lurked in the back of her mind. How would their meeting with Tammy turn out? But when she received a message from him confirming their meeting at the club the next day, her fears were dispelled. This message brought a smile to her face, and she was looking forward to their meeting. As the days passed, the tension began to ease, and a sense of harmony returned to the team. Tammy continued to help Sam with the move, and Tom and Gina renewed their friendship over lunch and a game of tennis. 
There were no signs of jealousy or any inappropriate behavior that could jeopardize their camaraderie. But when the week came to an end, the decisive moment came. Gina learned from Greg's sister that he went on a cruise, but not alone. Gina immediately realized that their relationship was crumbling, and turned to Tom. Could you come over? I really need someone around, she pleaded. Worried, Tom asked, has Greg returned home? Are you all right? Gina's response was discouraging. No, I didn't come back, and I'm not okay either, but I can't discuss it over the phone. Offering support, Tom assured her, don't worry, Tammy and I will be there in a few minutes. But Gina made a specific request. Tom, I want only you to come. I think Greg and I are done, and I desperately need your companionship. Understanding her request, Tom silently hoped that Tammy also realized the gravity of the situation. As Tammy slipped into her cozy pajamas, Tom suddenly appeared in the bedroom with a worried expression on his face. Intrigued, she asked, What's the matter? Tom quickly shared, Gina just called and informed me that something terrible had happened. She wants me to join her. I promise to tell you the details later. Tammy looked at the time and thought about it. It's already nine o'clock. Can't it wait until tomorrow morning? Deciding to support his friend, Tom replied, If it's really that serious, I think I should go with her. Maybe I should freshen up. With that, he hurriedly headed to the bathroom to clean himself up. Watching him spit out the toothpaste, she playfully teased him. It looks like someone is acting stupid. You can't get both, you know. She depends on me, and I'm leaving. Quickly leaving the bed, she settled down at the kitchen table, and he hurried out the door. Don't forget to call me, she called after him. Gina came to the conclusion that Greg just needed a little break from work and everyday worries. Assuming he was seeking solace in a family retreat by the lake, she was stunned to learn that he had gone on a cruise with another woman. No wonder he treated me no more than a cook and a maid, considering that he was looking for intimate satisfaction elsewhere. A few minutes later, Tom appeared on her doorstep, and when she entered, she happily hugged him, expressing her relief at his presence. Her arms wrapped tightly around his neck and her legs wrapped around his waist but he remained motionless and tense. Let's go upstairs and close the door, okay? He offered, and his hands moved down to support her. Unfortunately, she began to lose her grip. He gently placed his hand on the small of her back, and a blush appeared on his cheeks as he closed the door behind them. To his surprise, she was wearing only a robe under which her naked body was visible. He tried to stay calm, but the feel of her skin on his arm sent a wave of intense desire through him. Worried, he asked, Are you all right? She replied, Yes, I knew my marriage was in danger, but I never imagined that he would leave town with another woman. What should I do? She tried to hug him again, pressing her whole body against him, but he stepped back and headed for the kitchen. Do we have beer? What is it? He asked, disappointment in his voice. Damn, it looks like that's all we have. Greg got into the habit of drinking six bottles almost every night except when he went bowling. Damn, he probably went on a cruise with Elsie, Gina suggested. Elsie was a divorced woman who was on the same bowling team as Greg. Several times when I went bowling, I noticed how she snuggled up to him. Greg insisted that it was just a harmless flirtation, similar to the one between us. Tom decided to ignore it averting his gaze from her elegant light blue robe. But he couldn't help but notice that her breasts weren't burdened with a bra, and that fact briefly caught his attention. As for our relationship, I'm completely done with him, and it's been a long time. I keep a separate bank account in order to have enough funds in case of need. The head of my school has a brother and sister who are lawyers, and they kindly offered to help me with the necessary paperwork. Would it be difficult for you to accompany me to their office? As they were walking down the hallway, his phone vibrated. Looking at the screen, he noticed that Tammy was calling. Deciding not to answer, he wondered if she would be upset that he had decided to come here alone. Uncertainty clouded his response. Lately, Tammy had been spending a lot of time with this Sam while he was coming back, 
and it aroused suspicion. I remembered the saying, what's good for a goose is good for a goose. There were doubts about the nature of their relationship. Although she seemed determined to stay married, there were doubts about her intentions to keep him by her side. There was a lack of trust in Sam, which was worrying. I need to find out why his wife divorced him, and I want you to join me. I feel incredibly lonely right now. Even when I worked as a cook and maid, I had someone to trust. Tears were streaming down her face as she collapsed onto the couch. Overwhelmed by her grief, he knelt down next to her and hugged her tightly. I'm here to support you. Their eyes met, and their lips clung to each other tenderly. Tammy tried to distract herself from her thoughts, but she was overcome with anxiety. She was afraid that Tom might succumb to the charms of this seductive woman. Watching Greg and Gina's marriage crumble only increased her fears that she might become a victim herself. Eventually, fatigue got the better of her, and around midnight, Tammy fell asleep. But her sleep was abruptly interrupted when she heard the creak of the door opening. Startled, she jumped to her feet and looked towards the entrance. Tom, is that you? She exclaimed, desperately hoping it was her husband. Who else? Unless you gave Sam the key to our house? He replied, instantly realizing the tactlessness of his remark. I'm sorry, he added quickly, and there was remorse in his voice. Glancing at her watch, she noticed that it was already past two in the morning. It took him a full five hours to calm Gina's anxiety. Perhaps it's time to take an interest in the current perplexing situation. Fatigue overwhelmed them, and they were both depressed. It was wise to postpone this dialogue until the next morning. With a tired sigh, he returned to the bedroom. When he came out of the bathroom, he found her lying in bed and looking at him. I love you, Tom, she whispered. I love you too, he replied in return. Despite their fatigue, sleep proved to be a difficult task for them. The next morning, Tom got up and headed downstairs, but stopped when he heard her on the phone. Intrigued, he decided to eavesdrop. I can't do this anymore. I unequivocally offered to take a break, and now I have no confidence in when we will meet again, or if we will meet at all, she exclaimed. Stop texting and texting me. In a rage, she expressed her anger at Sam for going too far during their previous meeting. She was well aware that her marriage was in jeopardy because of Tom's prolonged stay with Gina the previous night. She was head over heels in love with him and was determined not to let him go without a fight. As soon as she heard that the shower was running upstairs, she hurried to prepare breakfast and was looking forward to reuniting with her husband. Good morning, my love. She greeted him with a warm smile, walking around the table and hugging him tightly. I want to apologize for my comment about Gina yesterday. I fully believe in your loyalty and will never back down from our commitments. He hesitated for a moment before answering, his voice full of emotion. I need to talk to you about what happened last night. Gina was overwhelmed with sadness and pain, and emotions overwhelmed her, and I couldn't resist. And we... Do you understand? She saw Tammy's usual radiant smile change to a frown, and her warm eyes turned as cold as coal. She was suddenly filled with anger. Tom, how dare you blame me for all the troubles? Even though I didn't have anything serious with Sam, it pisses me off that you hold me responsible for your betrayal. You can go to hell for having someone else. Tammy, please let me explain. Before she could finish her sentence, she abruptly grabbed her purse and headed for the door. He tried to stop her, but her car had already pulled away from the house and was driving down the street, and he was standing on the steps in his shorts. Hurriedly running into the house, he grabbed the phone and gave her a verbal message. We did not have an intimate relationship. Please give me a chance to explain everything and refrain from the actions that I fear you are going to take. If you take these actions, our relationship will be terminated, so please come back. In a panic, she rushed down the road, hurrying to Sam's house. Dressed only in silky black pajamas without underwear, she remained unperturbed, anticipating how soon she would throw it off and enter into intimate contact with her closest friend. As she neared the railroad crossing, the train rumbled down the road, 
forcing her to wait patiently. The prolonged stop gave her a moment's respite, allowing her to recover and gather her scattered thoughts. Taking a deep breath, she noticed a familiar name on the street sign adjacent to the tracks, and she changed the route. At this time, memories of the previous evening with Tom surfaced in Gina's memory. Memories of the previous night with Tom flashed through her mind of how he had come to ease the suffering caused by her husband. Throughout the years of their acquaintance in the first year of English, Tom was her constant savior, repeatedly coming to her aid, like a gallant knight in shining armor. After discussing the freedom of not having children and the joy of knowing everything in the world, she felt at ease and clung to him on the couch, seeking comfort in his arms. They had no idea what would happen next. While she was wandering in nostalgic thoughts, her thoughts were interrupted by the sound of the doorbell. Believing it was Tom, she opened the door, but was met with a furious expression on Tammy's face. Before she could utter a greeting, Tammy's hand slapped her hard across the face, accompanied by malicious words. You despicable woman! You should have stayed away from my man, shouldn't you? Bowing her head, she forcefully pressed her body against Tammy's, pushing them both out the door onto the flooded lawn, which was still being watered. When they hit the ground, Gina was on top of Tammy and quickly immobilized her, pressing her hands to her head. That's enough! What do you think happened last night? Tammy growled, trying to get up and push her away, but her weight was too small for Gina. Okay, I give up. Let me get up so we can talk, Tammy conceded, realizing that she had no other choice. Both women were completely wet, their clothes stuck to their skin. Crawling on their hands and knees, they both looked like they had just survived a torrential downpour. Their hair was stuck together on their heads in messy, tangled knots. A worried female voice broke the silence. Are you all right? Turning her head, Gina saw her elderly neighbor Elsie standing at the next door. Meanwhile, Tom was anxiously dressing, driven by fear that his wife might jeopardize her marriage to Sam out of revenge for what she thought he had done to Gina. Hastily dressing, he headed to Sam's house, but found that Tammy's car was clearly missing. Anticipating an unfavorable reception, Sam decided to knock on the man's door. Open up, asshole, I know she's inside, he called. Confused by the situation, Sam asked Tom, What the hell is going on, Tom? Without waiting for an answer, the enraged man forcefully pushed Sam in the back. Stunned but determined, Sam screamed, regaining his balance and preparing to defend himself. She's not here. Where can she be? Are you meeting her somewhere? Tom asked, trying to relieve the growing tension. I have no idea. She's your wife, Sam replied. Nevertheless, we need to talk. Please refrain from making false claims that you only want to be Tammy's closest friend. Your eyes betray your true intentions. You want to see her in your bed. Sam walked around him and firmly closed the door. Let's be honest. He led Tom into the living room and sat down opposite him on the sofa. You're right. I love Tammy and I always have. But she doesn't love me back. Believe me, I tried to win her over, but she always laughingly rejected any romantic ideas. I believe that marrying an amazing woman would solve my problems but I couldn't get rid of the desire to try again with my spouse. As a result, I made the difficult decision to end my marriage and move here, hoping for the last opportunity. When I met you, I felt hopeless at first, until Gina stepped in. Last week, while you and Gina were enjoying a game of tennis, I took Tammy to reminisce about the music we used to listen to together in high school. Suddenly, we were dancing and we shared a kiss. In the middle of our conversation, I mentioned that you and Gina were probably doing a similar thing, and suddenly she became aggressive. There was a threat in Tom's voice. Mentioning that you slept with her might be the last thing you'll ever say, buddy. Sam, in turn, diffused the tense situation by extending his hand in a conciliatory gesture. No, it didn't come to that. But we undressed and went into your bedroom, he admitted regretfully. If it wasn't for that damn wedding photo on your dresser, maybe I would have had a chance. His tone softened as he talked about the consequences. She panicked and locked herself in the bathroom. 
Despite my persistent attempts to reason with her, she only told me to leave and that we would never be able to communicate again. Deciding to move on, Sam concluded, I decided to cut off all contact with her and start all over again, focusing on my own life. Do it. I deserve to be hit, he said, preparing to strike. He prayed anxiously that Tom would change his mind. Regret filled his mind as he expected the blow, but the pain caught him off guard, and he lost consciousness as his left jaw took the blow on itself. A disoriented and confused Tom is desperately looking for someone who can give him answers. Suddenly it dawned on him. She must have gone to Gina's. His frustration grew, and he cursed his own forgetfulness. Gina and Tammy, soaked from watering the lawn, stood in front of each other with disheveled hair and soaked clothes, leaving water trails on the hallway floor. Tammy ran into her nemesis Gina after catching a glimpse of her in uncomfortable tight pajamas in front of their neighbor. Wanting to find out the truth, Tammy entered into a conversation with Gina, asking about the events of the previous night when Tom unexpectedly appeared to Gina. In an effort to be frank, Tammy told Gina not to even think about lying to her. Tell me the truth, Gina, she begged. Gina sighed, expressing a desire to confess, but complained that Tom, who was very attached to Tammy, did not dare to be intimate. Remembering the moment when Tom pulled himself together and, closing his eyes, firmly declared that infidelity was not something he would participate in while he was married. Despite her best efforts, Tammy's actions were stopped, as she quickly applied a technique that her brother had taught her long ago. She forcefully pushed her fist away from her right hip and hit Gina in the chin. Gina, who was shorter, rolled her eyes at the impact. Stunned, she instinctively pressed herself against the closet door and sank to the floor. At the same moment, darkness enveloped everything around Gina. Meanwhile, Tom drove past Gina's house without noticing Tammy's car. Unaware of her whereabouts, he still did not understand where she had disappeared to. He decided to go to the nearest clinic to examine the fingers of his right hand, because he was sure that at least one of them was broken as a result of the meeting with Sam. There were a lot of people at the clinic when he arrived. When he reached the reception desk, he handed his insurance card to the registrar and prepared to take a seat. But amidst the noise, he suddenly caught a familiar voice, the voice of his wife. She reminded the receptionist that she did not have a Blue Cross card because her purse was not with her. Trying to resolve the situation, Tammy, Tom's wife, kindly offered to use the woman's phone to call her husband and find out the necessary information. When the familiar sound of the phone reached her ears, she immediately realized that he was nearby. Turning quickly, she saw that he was standing behind her, clutching a vibrating phone in his hands. A mischievous grin spread across his face. He raised his right hand, distorted with agony, repeating her gesture. Watching the girl sitting at the counter, Tom suggested, The other woman owns the details of our insurance. Shall we sit down? He and Tammy retreated to a secluded corner in the waiting area. Unable to contain her joy, Tammy smiled at him from the top of her mouth. They leaned towards each other and their lips met in a gentle kiss. Gently touching her lips to his ear, she whispered softly, It seems that we have lost the concept of best friends. Maybe we should focus on strengthening our marriage and become each other's best friends instead? Tom whispered back, his voice filled with tenderness. I adore you. Tammy reciprocated, her voice filled with love. And I adore you too. Sam's journey took him to his former city, where he longed for reconciliation with his ex-wife, but his hopes were dashed when she decisively slammed the door in his face. Unaware that he doesn't know, she stumbled upon a real shrine that Sam built in the attic, and which is dedicated to their shared memories. Despite numerous futile attempts to contact Tammy again, Sam eventually accepted defeat and began to seek solace elsewhere. Fate intervened when he met a kind-hearted waitress named Tammy at a nearby truck stop, and over time their bond became even stronger. In the end, Sam found love again, this time with a woman bearing the same name as his former lover, but with a new promise of happiness. Unfortunately, 
After going on a cruise, Greg contracted a sexually transmitted infection, and upon returning to the city, he passed it on to several women. As a result, he remarried a woman who possessed exceptional skills as both a maid and a cook. Gina made a bold decision to make a career as a professional boxer and took part in two fights. Unfortunately, in both fights, she was defeated by a skillfully executed uppercut. Tammy and Tom decided to settle down and start a family, resulting in five children in their lives. It is worth noting that none of their children were named Samantha, Samuel, or Gina. Gentlemen, all you will hear is a completely made-up story, a literary composition, and it can rather serve as a script for some Hollywood blockbuster. And everything that happens in this story cannot serve as an example to follow. Rather, it serves as an example of how not to act in your life. And so, gentlemen, let's get started. I had no idea what a terrible ordeal awaited me when Jillian and I, or as she preferred to call herself Jill, tied the knot. Tony Rowan, that's my name. Back then, when I was happily sharing my life with Jill, I couldn't imagine what a nightmarish path lay ahead. We dreamed about how we would grow old together, how we would cherish our grandchildren. After two years of marriage, I started doing business as a consulting engineer, and Jill worked hard at a small medical supplies company. We concluded an agreement that before deciding on a parental feat, it is necessary to achieve stability and save some money. We lived together for eight blissful years, filled with happiness and an incredible intimate life. At that time, I sincerely believed that I had found the perfect partner in my wife. To create my own quiet haven, I invested in a charming cottage located on a quiet street. Despite the fact that the house required significant internal repairs, its structural integrity remained intact. The nearest neighbor lived 200 yards away, and only six other houses decorated the alley. With dedicated efforts, we worked tirelessly for almost a year until the house was finally completed. Although we handled most of the work ourselves, we brought in professionals for plumbing and electrical work. The completion of this project has brought me great satisfaction and relief. Jill and I often discussed our expectation of the day when we would have children, imagining an ideal future together. But anyway, fate decreed that everything got out of control shortly before our ninth anniversary. Jill's behavior towards me became increasingly harsh, which coincided with a virtually non-existent intimate life. Naturally, her attitude began to upset me. She started spending several nights a week with her colleagues, she claimed. Considering that she never came home before midnight, my mind began to lean towards the worst possible scenarios. But I was convinced that she would never betray me, although I did not understand at all how wrong I was. In search of advice, I turned to a childhood friend for advice. Barry Patton and I have been close friends since we crossed paths in our freshman year of high school. When the time came for my company to grow and appoint an executive director, I naturally turned to Barry because he was someone I could rely on. At first, when Barry heard my story, he was in disbelief, unable to understand that the truth was hidden behind my words. But when he delved deeper into the subtleties of the situation, his view of things changed dramatically. Tony, it's as clear as day. In my honest opinion, Jill is unfaithful to you. I'm sorry that I'm the one who has to break this disturbing news, but I'm so confident in my beliefs that I'm willing to put my entire career on the line. The seriousness in Barry's voice when he mentioned it confirmed my suspicions. I expressed my gratitude to him and retired to my office, preoccupied with thoughts about how to deal with this predicament. I sat at my desk and thought about what to do next. If Jill really cheated, our marriage will be irreparably damaged. The bitter reality was that she would be entitled to half of my estate. Faced with such gloomy prospects, I decided to seek the help of a private detective to find out the truth. After a thorough search, I managed to find a reputable detective who agreed to meet with me on the same day. After sharing his concerns with Joe Amos, the private investigator reassured me, assuring me that he would have the necessary evidence if Jill was indeed unfaithful. 
After this conversation, I felt some relief when I left his office. Although there is still a glimmer of hope in my thoughts, I quietly prayed that I had invested money in his services in vain. The next day, the technician met with me at the cottage to discreetly install hidden cameras. In addition, they connected a voice recorder to the phone line, although my skepticism led me to believe that it would not give any significant results. Jill demonstrated her intelligence by refraining from using her home phone during infidelity. A week later, I contacted Joe and received shocking news. An exhaustive report and a crystal clear DVD contained all the information, but I would caution against watching it, because knowledge and testimony are two completely different experiences. Despite thanking Joe for his guidance, I ignored his advice and continued watching the DVD in my office, paying him the remaining amount. The report reveals that her alleged outings with friends were actually an excuse for an intimate relationship with a colleague with whom she was infatuated. They repeatedly took long lunch breaks and even skipped the rest of the day to meet at a nearby motel for an intimate relationship. In addition, the report mentions that they repeatedly visited his house. The recorded DVD captures the incident that occurred on Thursday when Jill returned home with her male companion. Without delay, they proceeded to the bedroom, where for several hours they indulged in uninhibited behavior akin to unbridled creatures. Jill willingly fulfilled all her partner's wishes. Jill's words to her lover caused me genuine disgust. She expressed a strong desire to reunite with him and their companions, claiming that their bond was extraordinary. Watching her enthusiasm for these meetings, I was disgusted. I couldn't imagine that she could have an intimate relationship with other men, especially since we were similar in age and physique. It seemed to me unjustified to believe that he had any superiority over me. Faced with such overwhelming evidence, I thought about meeting them at the cottage, taking out my anger on him, and eventually kicking Jill out into the street. The following Thursday, after leaving work, I drove past our house and saw Jill's car and an unfamiliar car parked in the driveway. I parked on the street and headed for the house. When I entered the house, the sounds of passionate, intense activity came from above. Annoyed, I burst into the bedroom and attacked the intruders, demanding that they leave my apartment. But to my horror, it turned out to be a completely different person. This towering figure easily exceeded my height by at least six feet and significantly outweighed me in weight. And suddenly, darkness enveloped everything. When I regained consciousness, I found myself tied to a chair and gagged. Jill had been intimate with three men. Eventually, one of them noticed my awakening. Hey, look, the weakling is awake, they giggled. I watched Jill walk towards me. The woman I married was standing in front of me, smiling. She took the gag out of my mouth, and I couldn't resist asking, Why, Jill? Why do this to us? I understand that being married to you is boring. I want to have fun, and you only need kids and a wife at home to take care of you. But that's not going to happen. You thought you could barge in and ruin my fun, didn't you? Jill stared at me with an unhealthy smile on her face. As you can see, I have three real men here who satisfy my desires, so I don't need you anymore. My companions have taken care to get you to your destination. I sincerely hope that you will find it pleasant. The woman standing in front of me was a stranger to me. Obviously, she couldn't be my wife, Jill. She wouldn't betray me that way, would she? Suddenly, one of the men hit me in the face, causing me to lose consciousness. When I came to, I found myself in the dark and momentarily disoriented. Gradually, I realized that I was lying on my side, my wrists and ankles were securely tied, and the hood was blocking my view. When I came to my senses, the feeling of movement confirmed that I was in a car. Judging by the cold touch of the metal floor beneath me, I assumed it was some kind of van. It looks like someone else noticed my awakening and noticed. It looks like he's waking up again. There was relief in their words, as if my awakening had saved them from having to transport me further. Our destination must be close by now, I thought. 
the bumps and bumps of a car driving on an uneven or possibly unpaved road slightly disoriented me. The throbbing pain in his head served as a painful reminder of the blow he had suffered earlier. Despite the discomfort, I found solace in the fact that the car eventually stopped. I had no idea that it would have been better if they had continued to drive. Breaking the silence, the command sounded, Untie his legs! Get up! The voice ordered, followed by a strong slap on the back of the head. I won't carry you, now go! Suddenly I felt a blow. Echoes of the attacker's laughter filled the air as they retreated. I remained motionless, unable to move, and it felt like an eternity had passed, although it was probably only about ten minutes. It was only when the sound of a retreating car reached my ears that I dared to move, continuing to lie on the cold, unforgiving ground. I was thinking about the reasons for Jill's dismissive attitude towards me. What prompted her to engage in such lewd behavior? I have always treated her with kindness and respect. Agony swept through my body as I tried to get up, hampered by the restraints on my wrists. After numerous unsuccessful attempts, I finally managed to get back on my feet. My whole being throbbed as if I had been hit by a huge car. Realizing that my first priority should be to free my head from the hood, I firmly decided not to wander aimlessly in complete darkness. When I came across a thicket of bushes, I instinctively pushed against them, desperately trying to free myself from the binding hood. After a hard struggle, the hood finally caught, and I managed to free myself, allowing my eyes to gradually adjust to the changed darkness. However, my left eye remained closed, which made it practically useless, and I silently prayed that this violation would not become permanent. As the darkness gradually gave way to clarity, I found myself disoriented and did not know where I was at the moment. The only thing that could be said with certainty was that I had been abandoned in the heart of the forest, or perhaps in an impenetrable thicket. I carefully made my way forward, choosing the path that seemed the least difficult. After the fall, I was in no condition to try to climb the mountain. I wasn't a former soldier or anything like that, just an ordinary person. Gathering all my strength, I continued to move in one direction, despite the excruciating pain that accompanied me. Eventually, a glimmer of light in the distance caught my attention. As I approached the light source, I realized that it was coming from a fancy cottage or farmhouse. This sight caused a surge of energy in me, which prompted me to get to the gate. But my physical abilities were strained to the limit, and it turned out to be beyond my strength to open the gate. I let out a shrill scream from fright, which caused a sharp loss of consciousness. Gradually recovering, I forced myself to open my eyelids, but the left one remained stubbornly closed. It became obvious that I was in a confined space of the room. As I tried to sit up, I felt excruciating pain in my body, causing me to collapse back onto the bed. Please don't move. The voice asked softly. It looks like you've been in some kind of accident. Looking up, I saw a woman looming over me. The question flashed through my head. Who are you? And how did I end up here? She replied in a tone of concern. I found you near the house last night. Your piercing scream caught my attention, and when I started to figure it out, I found you lying unconscious on the ground. I remember trying to unlock the gate. Stay still and tell me the events that happened if your memory allows. Oh, I remember every detail perfectly. However, I was hesitant to tell the unknown lady standing in front of me about it. My name is Rosemary, but you can call me Rosie because I prefer it that way. So how did you end up in such a deplorable state? It's a pretty long story, and I'm not sure if I should tell it to you. Every time I tried to speak or take a deep breath, a sharp pain pierced my ribs. Should I contact the authorities? Don't, please. No cops. I promise I won't hurt you and I'll tell you what happened, just not right now. She smiled. When I came to my senses again, Rosie had already entered the room, and this time I gathered the strength to sit up straight. In her caring manner, Rosie laid out several pillows to provide proper support for my sitting position. Looking down, I noticed that my torso was wrapped in bandages, and my arms and legs were decorated with many cuts. Curiosity got the better of me. 
and I asked if there was a mirror here. Confirming my request with a nod, Rosie handed me a miniature looking glass. I let out a sigh as I looked at my reflection, watching the aftermath of the ordeal. Taking a deep breath, I turned to the woman standing in front of me. Are you finally ready to reveal your identity and explain what happened? My slight nod signified readiness. I began to tell Rosie every detail I could remember, from the moment I found Jill in bed with three men to my desperate attempts to open the gate for her. Tony, Rosie interjected, concern written all over her face. You really should go to the police. I answered pleadingly, No, please, I'm asking you not to involve the police. I need to deal with this on my own terms, in my own time. Rosie reluctantly agreed, saying, Okay, let it be your way. Please stay here until you are mobile and healthy enough to leave. I expressed my gratitude to Rosie for her kindness, even though I was not familiar with her personality. According to my estimates, she was about 45 years old, which exceeded my age by about 10 years. Rosie kindly offered me her phone so that I could contact Barry and assure him of my safety. Tony, where have you been? Everyone is furious, desperately looking for you. Jill is here who is worried about your disappearance. Barry, I have a request for you. If Jill asks, kindly inform her that you have not contacted me. I assure you, I will give detailed explanations during our upcoming meeting. If there are any work issues, I believe in your ability to handle them. After finishing the conversation he looked pleased. Rosie asked about my intentions. I plan to rest until I regain my strength and can return home. As soon as this is over I intend to hold some people accountable for their actions. Although I haven't determined the exact method yet, they will be responsible. Rosie silently agreed, her smile unwavering. Do whatever it takes Tony, but please be careful. At that moment it dawned on me that apart from her name, I didn't know anything about Rosie. Besides, it dawned on me that I didn't know my current location at all. When I heard the name of the nearest village from Rosie, I decided that I was at least three hours away from my own house. After several weeks of Rosie's devoted care and attention, I finally regained my strength and prepared to leave. After expressing my gratitude, I assured Rosie that I would find someone to pick me up. I'll drop you off at the train station in the village, she kindly offered, adding that no matter who I turned to, they would never find this secluded place because of its remoteness. As I squeezed into Rosie's little car, I realized that I hadn't fully regained my former vigor. Thanking Rosie for her continued support, she humbly replied, Tony, do what you have to do, but please be careful. When I was impatiently waiting for the gentleman to come and give me a ride, he met me with a shocked expression on his face. God, Tony, what happened to you? He exclaimed, appearing in front of me. During our trip, I told Barry all the details of the situation, who listened incredulously. I think I understand why she did it, Barry. If we had separated, she would have been entitled to half of our property. Jill's greed knows no bounds. She wants to get everything, I said with a note of bitterness in my voice. I suspect that she promised her friends significant sums if they successfully get rid of me. Given the significant value of our company, I can only imagine that she will sell it and spend her days indulging in promiscuous sexual relations with anyone. You can stay by my side, my friend. If anyone asks, I will honestly say that I do not know about your whereabouts. I appreciate your help, Barry. Please take my laptop from the office and I will also need clothes. Barry chuckled, noting that he felt like he was providing shelter to a wanted man. Although this has not happened yet, there is a possibility that I will be detained when I take revenge. In that case, it's in your best interest to avoid detection. I prefer not to tell you about my plans. On the way, we stopped at a shopping mall. I successfully got hold of several pairs of jeans, t-shirts, socks, underwear, and a pair of sneakers. At the moment, this collection is quite enough. I had a full wardrobe at home, or at least I hoped so. Fortunately, it was already night when we arrived at Barry's house, which saved me from possible gossip among the neighbors. According to Barry, Jill convincingly played the role of a caring wife. 
she turned to everyone she knew in search of me. With the exception of the police, she contacted everyone else. She kept in constant contact with Barry, contacting him daily with questions about whether there was any news about me. Naturally, his answer was always negative. As time passed, my recovery progressed, and I was finally able to walk without experiencing severe pain. Barry informed me that Jill's calls had been reduced to once a week. I assumed that she must have been preoccupied with her pleasures and didn't pay attention to the fact that I wasn't there. Sometimes time for reflection can be useful. In my situation, it made me think about the scale of my revenge. Imagine how terrible it would be. A thirst for revenge seized me, and I carefully weighed the possible options. Spending countless hours idling, I came up with various strategies to confront Jill and her disgusting accomplices. The problem, of course, was that most of my plans depended on the participation of other people, and I did not expect this in any way. Driven by a bitter feud, I plunged into the depths of the internet, stumbling upon the infamous dark web. Plunging into its sinister contents, I discovered that it is possible to hire a person who will solve all my problems. After much thought, I came up with a plan, but I didn't know how to put it into practice. Overcome with despair and disgust, I decided to leave a message asking for help in solving the chemical problem. To my horror, I received several responses from eccentric personalities. But in the midst of all this chaos, one person seemed to understand the essence of my predicament. Intrigued, I immediately replied to his message. As our exchange of opinions progressed, I gradually became convinced of his sincerity. It seemed to suit him that I was not connected with law enforcement agencies. Therefore, he provided me with an installation program that securely encrypted our subsequent communication. After logging out and turning off the VPN program, I started searching for recommended products on the internet. It took a little longer than expected to find the brands I needed. After I successfully purchased all the necessary items, I quickly realized that the exact time Jill and her lovers were in the house was crucial for this plan to work. With this thought in mind, I turned to the internet again and purchased various listening devices or bugs. In the evenings, Barry and I often sat together and had meaningful conversations. He was never interested in my plans, and I didn't reveal them either. Our business was booming, and many new customers came to the company. I assured Barry that I would probably be back at the office in a week or two. But when problems arose, I quickly returned home and found Jill's car parked in the driveway. Whether she had a pleasant evening or not, I didn't care. I noticed Jill leave the house, and five minutes later I entered it. Fortunately, she didn't think to change the locks. It seemed obvious to her that I was no longer alive, which meant there was no reason to worry. I've discreetly installed a surveillance device in both the living room and the bedroom. It should be noted that despite the presence of men in her home, it remained immaculate and orderly. The bed was decorated with fresh linen, and there were no signs of anyone else's presence. In the late afternoon, I heard Jill talking to a man. I immediately recognized in his voice one of those who were in the van. He was in her company, was close to her, and revealed plans to meet with the others on Friday evening. A wave of anxiety swept over me. I can't wait, Jill said. How many participants will join us? I successfully convinced nine people to take part in the event, bringing the total number of participants to ten. But unfortunately, one of them will not be able to attend this week. However, nine is quite enough for my preferences. I closed the laptop, not wanting to hear any further details. I hoped that my strategy would be successful, and as a result, after Friday, Jill would no longer be available to anyone. Evening came, and I hid in the bushes near our house, looking forward to the start of the gathering. When Jill pulled up to the house, she was followed by a whole convoy of cars. After giving them a generous 30 minutes to settle in, I leisurely headed for the back door, confident that this would be enough time for them to get on with their business. But my attention was attracted by a sudden noise coming from above. Jill's shout of delight echoed through the house, mixed with the cheers of the others. 
Intrigued, I climbed the stairs with extreme caution, making sure that all the inhabitants of the house were safely gathered in the bedroom. Methodically, I poured the first liquid onto the carpet, creating a trail that led back to the kitchen. This process was carefully repeated with the second liquid. When mixing the substances, there was practically no smell. They warned me that the amount I use directly affects the quality of the final result. Now, back in the kitchen, I'm faced with a difficult task. One wrong step, and we will be in complete chaos. The third liquid, in fact, acted as a catalyst, triggering a chain reaction that, when combined with the others, would lead to complete chaos. I poured the liquid into a nearby puddle, along with two others. After waiting a few minutes for them to merge, I quietly left the room, making sure that the door closed noiselessly behind me. At a brisk pace, I hurried down the path to the place where my rented car was parked. As I was driving away, a bright and intense flash caught my attention in the rearview mirror. Without thinking, I raced on until I got to Barry's house. Fortunately, Barry was on a date, which allowed me some privacy upon arrival. After taking a refreshing shower, I settled into bed for the night. The next morning I headed back to the house, determined to assure Jill that I was alive, despite the persistent attempts of her friends. In parallel with this mission, I intended to collect my clothes and some personal belongings, knowing full well that they had all been destroyed by fire. But as I was making my way through the alley, my progress was stopped by a policeman. I'm sorry, sir, but you can't move on, he informed me. I explained, actually, I live in Laurel's cottage. This is my home. Could you park the car and wait here? The officer ordered, approaching the quaint cottage. After a while, he reappeared in the company of a man dressed in an elegant suit. Mr. Rowan, the newcomer introduced himself. I'm Detective Inspector Hobson. May I inquire about your whereabouts last night? To be precise, I was temporarily staying with a friend. My wife and I decided to live separately. Curious, Detective Inspector Hobson continued. How long have you been staying with this friend? A couple of months, Mr. Rowan confirmed, offering a time frame for his current residence. There was a fire in the cottage last night. May I take a look? It's hard to believe that this place which was once my home has been damaged. We walked along the path together, and the detective continued to ask about what had happened. Were there any flammable substances stored in my house? The only thing worth mentioning is the small gas canister in the barn, which I used exclusively to refuel the lawnmower. The cottage turned into a ruined ruin. One end of the wall collapsed, and the roof tilted at an awkward angle. Obviously, sir, the fire destroyed the entire building. Fortunately, the people who were in your house managed to escape along with your wife. I do not know what your wife is doing, but everyone who was in the house was completely naked. I stood there looking shocked, as did everyone else in my entourage. I thanked the detective again and went to my car. After driving a few miles away, I called Barry, explained the situation to him in detail, and Barry confirmed that he would definitely confirm that we had been home all night. Of course, they asked me about the fire. Then I told the police that Jill and I had broken up. I did what I wanted to do, and it made me feel better. After this incident, Jill lost her mind. She experienced such a severe shock that she could not think correctly. She was sent to a psychiatric clinic for treatment, but even four months later her mental state did not return to normal. My main task was to express gratitude to Rosa for saving me. Unfortunately, despite the help of the locals, I was unable to find her cottage. Surprisingly, Barry didn't ask about the fire. Instead, he kindly offered to set me up on a date if I so desired. Currently, I am focused on continuing to live, especially since a woman lives in the same house with me. Although we are only exchanging greetings so far, if our relationship develops and becomes more serious, then a prenuptial agreement will be drawn up before considering the possibility of marriage.